our keynote speaker is Adam Elshog, but I won't introduce him because um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce David Aykroyd, who is the Managing Director of Baxter Healthcare, to introduce uh, our keynote speaker. David. Thank you, uh, Minister Skinner, Dr. Mary Foley, Secretary, New South Wales, and of course, distinguished guests. From the title of this talk, you can't always get what you want. And being both a father of a 10-year-old daughter and a Rolling Stone fan, or Rolling Stones fan, I'm happy to say I'm all ears for this next session. As an advocate for reducing waste in the health system, Associate Professor Elshaw knows, as we all do, that resources in the health sector are both precious and finite. Achieving the best patient outcomes for those resources needs to be a top priority for all of us. Like Mick Jagger, Associate Professor Elshaw is hot property, though apparently not so hot property that his babysitter would turn up this morning on time, so we did actually get a two for one this morning, okay? He's the recipient of numerous research rewards, awards and speaks regularly at conferences, government, academic, insurance and health technology assessment uh, groups internationally. From the Menzies Centre of health, for Health Policy, School of Public Health, the University of Sydney, Please welcome Associate Professor Adam Elshaw. Thank you very much, David. And uh, Minister, Secretary, thank you for the generous invitation to present to you today. And I uh, also want to acknowledge the, uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. I was uh, somewhat taken by the, the dance presentation this morning um, and transcendent almost to the point that I forgot where I was, which is not a good thing for your keynote speaker. But uh, we're going to press on. So um, for those who... Uh, missed my abstract, there's a reference there to William Lloyd. Uh, hands up, who knows about William Lloyd? Anyone in the room? No, I don't expect you to. So William Lloyd made an observation over 100 years ago referring to the tragedy of the commons, and I'm going to touch on that in a, in a moment or two in one of my slides. Um, I have the usual disclosures that I'd like to make. This is the first slide of disclosures. This is where I receive some of my funding and also some of the groups to whom I provide advice. My second disclosure is that you can't unhear or unsee my presentation. Now, I think this slide is a direct reference to the overdiagnosis movement that's happening worldwide. I think poor old Kermit, what on earth is he going to do with that information? Um, an armectomy, perhaps? I don't know. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, health system sustainability and the notion of opportunity cost. Uh, waste in the form of low-value health care. And I'm going to define that briefly. We're going to provide some examples and also look at some remedial initiatives. And this is where some of the policy innovations that uh, I've observed and been involved in internationally come in. I'm going to talk a little bit about choosing wisely, um, alternative models of uh, care and payment, particularly from the United States. And I'm going to touch on the Mars Excite project from uh, Ontario, Canada. Now, on the right-hand side there, you can see that I've got some uh, listed... Uh, affiliations with the United States. So I've actually spent three of the last four years in the United States um, with the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, with the Commonwealth Fund and with Harvard Medical School. So a lot of my presentation today is actually focused on North America somewhat and that's um, partly because I've spent so much time there but also because for the rest of today you're going to be hearing a lot about some of the innovations locally. So I'll be giving you that international perspective. Okay, so the tragedy of the commons. An observation was made over 100 years ago in England where there was a common, a common pasture, a common paddock, where farmers would bring along their livestock to graze. And an observation was made that individuals, acting independently and rationally, according to each one's self-interest, can actually behave contrary to the whole group's long-term best interests, and they can deplete a resource. Now, it wasn't until the 1970s that this notion of the tragedy of the commons was actually applied to health systems. And the Mick Jagger reference comes in because in the same month that the Rolling Stones released their Let It Bleed album and You Can't Always Get What You Want song, um, this, this notion of uh, the tragedy of the commons within health systems was also made apparent. And now as we enter uh, you know, 2014, approaching 2015, you open any newspaper, turn on the TV and all you hear about is health system sustainability, whether it be in Australia or around the world. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what are we talking about when we think about health system sustainability? These are two graphs essentially showing the same thing. We're looking at international comparisons of spending on healthcare from uh, 1980 to 2010. The left-hand side is per person spend. The right-hand side is percentage of G G uh, GPD. So Australia is the black line. And as you can see, we sit somewhere in the middle down the bottom there on both. 
there is a clear outlier there in the United States who spend about double what we spend in Australia and uh, almost double for what any other comparable OECD country spends on healthcare. So when we look at that kind of figure, I like to ask the question, well, so what is this sustainability question that we all ask about? And I think it ignores a couple of things. It ignores that the US experience reveals that a very high GDP spend, which is double Australia's, can actually be absorbed within the, health, within the, within the economy. There is no obvious tipping point and there's extreme elasticity in what we think about um, sustainability. So at what point did it become unsustainable? Technically, Australia could double our spend today or tomorrow, and we still wouldn't be quite where the US is, and yet they seem to be managing, or are they, in a healthcare environment. The other point is that the, the focus on sustainability, in my opinion, concentrates too much on how much we spend and not enough on the quality or the value of what we achieve. And also, it distracts from a bigger picture question around micro, meso, and macro level resource allocations that would foster the sort of country that we all want to live in. And I'm going to touch on that briefly. But first of all, opportunity cost. So anyone who's done Health Economics 101, we try and teach this concept of opportunity cost, which is once you spend a dollar in one way, you can't spend that dollar in any other way. Now, that applies in healthcare. It applies in any, any uh, economic environment, including in the family home. So, this is a nice slide that was put together by David Squires at the Commonwealth Fund, looking at the United States, if it had matched its spending to the second highest spending country from the period 1980 to 2010, what they could have done with those extra resources. It would equate to $15.5 trillion. There are too many zeros for me to even think about on that number. But they could have tra transformed their $11.6 trillion federal debt into a $3.9 trillion surplus. They could have sent 175 million students to college for a four-year degree. They could have covered the size of South Carolina with solar panels, or my personal favorite is they could have bought everyone in the world four iPads. So that's a lot of money, but the notion is clear there, and I'm glad that you laughed because the next slide is not quite so funny. And this is the graph that I think we could actually spend the next 20, 30 minutes on if we wanted to. This also represents opportunity cost. This is a jurisdiction. Anybody want to guess which jurisdiction this is? I've given you a hint. It's over 5 million people, but less than 8 million people. And what this is looking at is the blue bars on the graph were what was spent in fiscal year 2001. The sort of burnt orange lines that you can see there are the outlays for fiscal year 2011. And you can see far left for healthcare, and this is talking about acute hospital care primarily, there was a 59% increase in spending dedicated to acute hospital care. But there's opportunity cost here. To fund that, there had to be decreases in other areas of the portfolio. So this is that, the real question that we need to ask when we think about sustainability, as well as the quality issue. So anybody want to put their neck out? Which jurisdiction is this? Is it Victoria? Hands up. Couple. Is it New South Wales? Hands up. Couple there. It's Massachusetts. Massachusetts now spends 42% of its state budget on healthcare. So, the area that I focus on in my research has to do with waste within the healthcare system. Because when we think about expenditure, there's good expenditure, there's value added expenditure, and there's very bad expenditure. And the bad expenditure is the waste in the system. And I think it adds insult to injury. Because if you're wasting resources, you're losing them to other applications. And I look around at me today and I think about all of the wonderful innovations that I'm seeing around here. All of those require resources and we could be doing more of that if we took money away and resources away from the wasteful areas within the healthcare system. And what I mean, and some of the examples I'm gonna talk about are inappropriate tests or treatments, excessive service intensity or sophistication relative to the expected benefit, excessive frequency of service relative to the expected benefit and so on. And I'm going to give you some, some uh, examples of that. This graph, a famous graph from Don Berwick, um, former administrator of CMS in the United States. Uh, Don Berwick postulated that there is 30% of our healthcare expenditure goes towards waste and he disaggregated it conceptually in this graph here. And now, I think it's actually just a conceptual model rather than a specific quantification of where the waste lies. I'm going to focus today primarily in the overtreatment section. 
And I also want to point out that this is also something that is mentioned and noticed within the community. Um, the Commonwealth Fund did a survey some years ago where they asked a representative sample of the population from numerous countries, in the last two years, has a doctor recommended a treatment you thought had little or no benefit? And Australians reported, they were 17% of Australians reported that that was the case. And you can see it varies from 10% to 20% in other countries. So it's worth us noting that this is actually something that is within the public's consciousness as well. Uh, I'm going to use Medicare as an example. We actually have 5,700 items listed on Australia's Medicare benefit schedule. The majority of them are long-standing, dating way back into the sort of 70s in terms of how they were initially formulated uh, around their item descriptors and their pricing schedules. What's not very commonly known is that only a very, very small proportion of those have ever really been assessed against modern standards of safety, effectiveness or cost effectiveness. Now, that's not to suggest that they're unsafe or ineffective, it's just that we don't know. But increasingly, evidence is coming out demonstrating that actually some of these procedures that we thought were delivering value to patients are not, and some in fact are delivering harm. And I always use this slide because sometimes the service itself is actually perfectly reasonable and effective and safe, but it's in the wrong hands. <laughs> or it's being applied to the wrong patient group or something like that. It's a bit of a cheap shot. I should stop using that slide. Okay, now, this is the most technical thing you're going to see all day, so just bear with me for a second. I like to use this uh, typology by Skinner and Chandra to talk about what I mean when we think about low-value care, for who, when, and with what confidence. On the left-hand side, you can see that the axis is talking about quality benefits, but that can be any benefit, any sort of health outcome benefit that you like. Along the bottom, we're talking about procedure quantity. Now, in category one, we consider these to be high-value procedures because almost from, from the beginning of when we start performing procedures, for most of the patients who receive them, we can consider them to be high ones. So we're happy with that. That's what we want from our healthcare system. On the other side, we consider these to be category three procedures, and these are the low-hanging fruit. And you can see that from day one, these procedures are not delivering high value. In fact, they could be potentially harmful, and we really want these out of the system. But I would argue that these are few and far between, actually, um, around the world. More interesting and more common is this middle category. And that is that you have any given procedure, and for that procedure, and look at this, there are three nice groups of um, uh, people in the audience here. So we know that there's a group of patients for whom it's going to be very high value, and we're going to say that that's you over that side. So we know that you're all very good candidates for a certain procedure, but unfortunately, everyone on this side, you're very poor candidates for that procedure. But then there's also a big grey zone in the middle where we don't really know. Doctors don't know. Uh, and that's where some of the new research that's coming out is starting to shed some important light on that. So, over to some examples. So, a couple of years ago, I published a paper in the Medical Journal of Australia, which uh, highlighted 150 services that are potentially low value. Since then, um, NICE in the UK have come out with a list of do not do recommendations. Other people like Vinay Prasad from the US have come out with a whole list of services that we think are actually quite low value in certain instances. Um, I published this work in the New England Journal of Medicine, which looked at the vertebroplasty procedure. Uh, the year that I did this analysis in the US, they were performing 80,000 of these a year at a cost of about $4 billion annually. Uh, now, this procedure has since been removed from Australia's Medicare benefit schedule because it's seen as not offering any benefit over and above conservative treatment. So that's an example of a case where it's universally low value. So if you like, that's the red box. Everybody who receives that, or most people who receive that procedure, are low value. But new research is coming out, and most of the, what I'm going to show you, other than the Al-Khatib example, is actually just work that's been published in the last couple of months. So Al-Khatib did, did some work looking at the insertion of automatic implantable cardiac defibrillators in the United States, and found that 22.5% of those could be determined as being inappropriate, non-evidence-based insertions. Only three months ago, Hannon and co-workers looked at the New York State Diagnostic Catheterization Database. They looked at 9,000 patients retrospectively and rated them for appropriateness. And you can see 35 fit into the green box, 40% were in the uncertain category, and 25% were rated as inappropriate. Those procedures should not have happened based on the patient characteristics. Another example from the United States, again, this only came out 
about six weeks ago from the American Academy of Orthopaedic Surgeons who looked at the appropriateness criteria for the management of full thickness rotator cuff tears and they found a whopping 53% from a category that they looked at or a, a cohort could be considered rarely appropriate. And the final example is looking at uh, total knee arthroplasty. Now this isn't a question asking about the type of prosthesis that was implanted, which is often the questions that are being asked. This is actually going a step back and saying, were these patients even considered appropriate to go forward for surgery? And the work by Riddle and co-workers determined that 34% of patients who went under the knife were not good candidates to do so. So this is really quite important work that's coming out really of, of late. Um, and I do point to the power of this grey zone, and I think it's a very important point to make because this work risks being quite controversial, and one of the reasons that it risks being controversial is because I think the clinical community, doctors particularly, felt under undue pressure that this idea of appropriateness was a binary discussion. Something was either appropriate or inappropriate. And I think that was a very unfair and very challenging position to put them into because, in fact, there's an awful lot of uncertainty that's out there within the evidence base. And it's one thing for me to go back in time or all of these people to go back in time and measure what might be appropriate and inappropriate in the past. It's a very different case to ask a doctor in, with a patient in front of them to know what's appropriate going forward. And that's where some of the innovation needs to come in this area now that we're starting to measure where it occurs. Um, this work I published just a couple of months ago uh, where we looked at a representative sample of US Medicare patients in the United States. We actually looked at 26 low value procedures. We found that 42% of the Medicare population in the United States received at least one of those low value procedures in a 12 month period at a cost of up to $8.5 billion per year. Okay. So something is getting lost in translation here. And my work in the policy world is starting to uh, try and reverse this trend, trying to minimise those inappropriate procedures so we can reallocate those resources back to the green box where we know patients are going to achieve higher benefit. So I've been working with the Ontario Ministry of Health who have actually been running an appropriateness initiative for the last five or six years. This example comes from Ontario where they did some work with vitamin D blood tests. You can see that their vitamin D blood tests have actually skyrocketed over the years. So we did some work around um, some clinical detailing, getting an understanding of why those levels escalated as they did. Certain uh, mechanisms were put in place, including a ministerial recommendation. And now we've achieved a 90% reduction over two years. I shouldn't say we, I should say they. They've done most of the work, which in just the province of Ontario is saving them $60 million per annum for that one blood test. Now, it's not saying that the blood test is inappropriate. It's saying that its diffusion, that diffusion curve was inexplicable and really not backed by any good clinical evidence and it should come back to a, a, a level considered to be appropriate. In total, in Ontario, they're now saving $852 million per year recurring from some of the projects that have been put in place around a number of low value healthcare services. Now it's improving healthcare quality because it's actually allowing for reallocation of resources to other areas of healthcare. So although I measure there in dollars, what we can't measure is actually the added gain in health that it's, that it's delivering. And I should also say that the $852 million figure is just the individual practices themselves. It doesn't include all of the flow on costs that sometimes come from delivering an inappropriate practice. Can we do this in Australia? Well, we are doing this in Australia. Um, and this too comes from, from Ontario. This actually, my colleague just emailed this to me a couple of days ago. Ignore the headline. It's the blue commercial, the advert that I'm pointing to here. So this is from the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Um, they're really pushing this agenda very heavily within Ontario. Um, and uh, the, the new tool that we're talking about in this commercial is a tool that was developed by Dr. Alison Paprika um, in, in Ontario, and I was one of her mentors for that project, that's now being rolled out across the province, and that's what's contributing to these $852 million in savings, recurring savings. At the Medicare level in Australia, this work is actually occurring. So that's a, this is just a screenshot from the Medical Services Advisory Committee website where you can see that actually there's a current... Uh, review process underway for a host of existing Medicare benefit schedule items. And recently I also wrote a piece in the Australian Financial Review 
Um, and again, I, having come from the Ontario, I, I used the Australian example of vitamin D blood tests. Um, you may not be aware, but there's actually been a 4,800% increase in vitamin D blood testing in Australia over the past decade. So we went from spending $3 million 10 years ago to $145 million annually on vitamin D blood tests. Now again, we're not questioning whether or not this is an effective test. We know it's an effective test, but we know it's an effective test for a certain group of patients and at a certain interval or frequency. And I don't think there's anybody who can really justify the numbers of tests that are being, uh, that are being revealed on that graph there. The Choosing Wisely campaign in the US, are people familiar with that? Can I have a show of hands of who might be familiar? So this is an interesting campaign from the US. So the, the premise behind the Choosing Wisely campaign is to spark discussion about the need or lack thereof for many frequently ordered tests and treatments. The main objective is one of improved safety and quality via reduction in practices that are at best of little to no clinical utility and at worst harmful. So this started back in 2009 where three specialty societies volunteered to develop their own top five lists. So these are doctors coming forward saying we want to develop our own top five list of specialty specific practice changes that would improve patient outcomes through better treatment choices and reduce risks. Costs were not explicitly considered but they're certainly part of the equation here. Fast forward to 2012, the Choosing Wisely campaign was formally la launched and they had nine specialty societies at that point. Um, consumer Reports is involved and that has a huge patient um, and consumer contribution being made. This year, there are now 50 additional societies who have joined and there are now over 200 healthcare practices that have been put forward as top five candidates for things that we shouldn't be doing. Choosing Wisely Canada started up this year and NPS Medicine Wise has announced that that's, they're going to be running an Australian Choosing Wisely campaign um, as well. So that's a nice innovation, I think, that's coming to Australia. So now I'm going to segue, and I'm going to talk a little bit about some other things out of the United States that I think have been quite interesting from a policy innovation point of view. And interestingly as well, despite the visibly hyper-partisan nature of, uh, of politics and of healthcare in the United States, there is actually a long-lasting legacy that's being built away from the spotlight, and it comes through some of these alternative care and alternative payment models that are being trialled and rolled out across the country. And there's the CMS, CMS Innovation Centre, which has uh, been funded to do some evaluations of this work. So there's multi-stakeholder development panels, heavily linked to quality of care, critical eye on measures of quality that are patient important. There's a very strong evaluation component. And interestingly, they've actually removed this entire process from the political cycles with stretch targets to 2017 to 2022. They're looking to ways of trying to reward doctors for quality and efficiency over pure quantity. And there's an upfront acknowledgement that some of these models of integrated care and of alternative payment arrangements some might succeed, some will ultimately fail, and some might need tweaking. And uh, when you're actually in the US and you're seeing some of these being rolled out, even at the small centres of excellence, it's actually quite an exciting um, feel that's happening over there. Now, this is a busy slide, but I really just want you to peruse some of these numbers. These are some of the early successes that are being achieved from some of these integrated care and alternative care models and some of the alternative payment models as well. Um, now, I've had a conversation with Dr. Foley about some of these. Um, there's an awful lot of fat on the bone in the US. They're working off a pretty high baseline, I think, in terms when we think about waste. So I think there's a lot that they can gain early. I actually think some of the Australian public hospitals run very efficiently, and I don't think that just because I'm um, being, you know, uh, supportive of my own environment, but some of the research that we've done has shown that Australian public hospitals are incredibly efficient. So I'm not sure we can hope for the same sorts of improvements locally, but perhaps you can advise me otherwise. And I also want to point out a good read. So Dr. Johnny Tates, who was a colleague with me as a Harkness Fellow in the United States, and he could be in the room here as a paediatrician here in Sydney. Um, Johnny spent a year travelling around to all of these centres of excellence, asking and engaging with um, some of these policy changes to uh, find out how they engage physicians to support these quality and safety uh, improvements that were being made. So I, I recommend that paper to you if you're interested. Now in the last five minutes, I'm also going to jump again to something that is a little bit more aligned with the theme of today's symposium, which is the innovation world. And again, this is an example out of Ontario, Canada. Um, and it's the Mars Excite project. Now, Mars came first. 
And Mars is an incubator of 300 high potential health startups. And this was a, a collaboration between industry, government, and philanthropy, where they put all of these uh, startups together in the health field to think about what can be offered uh, to the system. But they found that they were having a problem that they recognised in Ontario, and that was all of these innovators would come together uh, and develop a product, and then they would go towards and ask the, uh, the regulators and the payers whether or not they would fund these in the healthcare system, and the payers would say, well, no, because we have no interest in that technology. You haven't asked us if it's important to us. Uh, you know, you haven't done enough research that we think is adequate. So along came Excite, and it was the Ontario Ministry that actually started the Excite component, and they filled that box in the middle there. So what they did now is they implemented an application process. The application process means that they, the people actually have to submit a proposal, and the proposal goes to government. It goes to the hospitals, to the directors of hospitals and, lo and the local health district equivalents. And those stakeholders get to actually decide whether or not this is something that is important to the health system. If they think it is, then they help them actually design trials that will test it in real time, um, and it will go towards then being put forth for regulatory and payment approval. And these are some of the things. They ask the right questions early to generate high quality data to satisfy evidentiary standards as laid down by health agencies. So is it relevant? Surprisingly, they were finding that before the Excite project was in place, many of them were just irrelevant. The innovators thought they were highly relevant, but they were not relevant at all. Is it breakthrough? Does it have disruptive potential? Will it deliver substantially better clinical outcomes at substantially lower costs? Will it improve patient outcomes? Will it create opportunities to identify obsolescence for existing technologies? And that's important because we know that as the pie gets bigger, we can't keep adding resources, so we have to move things out to allow for the innovations to come in. What's the magnitude of effect and stage of readiness of the technology? So I know that Luckily, um, that sort of work is being uh, happening with the Minister's uh, Fund for Innovation and Technologies. So, I, but I do think it's a, a wonderful model because it's actually translating, um, it's, it's front-loading those innovations with the evidence and the requirements that the end users are required to work with. I'm going to end with this slide. Two weeks ago, NHMRC announced their funding round for this year. And as usual, there's a 14 or 15 or 16 percent success rate. So it makes me hark back to a to a simpler time when uh, Dr. Otto Vorberg wrote to the Association of German Science asking, I require 10,000 marks. And it was fully funded at the time. So uh, I quite like to reverse. Can we introduce You that? should be so lucky, Adam. You I'm should be so lucky. <laughs> sure, it's sustainable. Please thank Adam. Thank you very much. Running a little bit over, but um, just tell me how they got the vitamin D testing down in uh, Ontario. So, what I didn't show in the slide there is I actually noticed that in hospital testing was a steady increase. It was actually in GP land that it had gone up and through the roof. And it was partly because there was a success in the campaign at the time where there was actually a push for more vitamin D testing to be done. So, all kinds of things were done, like um, awareness raising to GPs, but they also did something where they put a little box on the test ordering software, where GPs just ended up ticking it without even really thinking about it. Um, and it led to the increase there, as it did here in Australia. So one of the things they did was they removed that tick box. They still allowed it, but they, they buried it within a drop-down menu. They also went out to the clinical community and said, look, we think this is above what is reasonable. Help us to bring it down, and we're going to do some audit and feedback of those numbers. And a combination of things actually managed to get that number down. And what's the role of the patient in that? Well, I think... And there's um, a patient driving change, because that's choosing yeah. wisely. strategy. That's choosing wisely, exactly. So, uh, you know, the choosing wisely strategy is for the clinicians to come up with these lists, but for those lists to be translated into um, information documents that patients can take to their doctor and actually ask a series of questions around the appropriateness of a given condition. And is there evidence that activating patients in that way changes clinician behaviour? Uh, there is, although not specifically from the Choosing Wisely campaign yet. Um, there's some interesting work done out of the US where they're looking at... Um, uh, a choice or what we call sensitive uh, specific practices like surgeries where if uh, patients are empowered with uh, objective information we find that the rate of uh, elective surgeries can decrease by 30%. Now you, you chose vertebroplasty there. 
Yeah. Which was an example of disinvestment. Right. We're going to stop doing this. Right. And there are a whole series of other things there that the Commonwealth's talking about. We'll just stop doing it. And of course, this is an issue for the system manager. Yeah. Because you're buying stuff that happens. So, for example, there's unnecessary knee arthroscopies that are happening right. all over the New South Wales healthcare system right. under the control of knee surgeons within the public system. Yeah. Um, how do you. <coughs> it was World War III to get vertebroplasty off. Yeah. How do you avoid World War III? Well, I think the way you avoid World War III is that A, you, you listen to the evidence, uh, and B, um, as I mentioned in the Well, that didn't slides. stop World War III with vertebroplasty. No, it didn't. But I think there's also now a bit of a political shift in this area to actually um, think, well, what is our tolerance for uncertainty within the evidence? And at a certain point, we have to make a decision one way or another. And one of my mentors, I think, had a great saying, which is, now the science is, is informing us. And at one point, it was easy just to make no decision, because it was easy to make no decision. But in fact, a decision not to act is still a decision with implications for patients' health. So, so not acting is just as, because then you're saying, well, we, we are accepting the fact that procedures are being performed that are unsafe, ineffective. Have you looked at the multiplier effect? We're talking about integrated care, but one of the things about integration, well, it's not really integration, but a decision a general practitioner makes yeah. can have a flaw in effect into the right. public hospital system. Yes. Because I do an unnecessary CT scan of the back. I find something that I was never meant to find the end up in the orthopedic outpatients. Right. The orthopedic surgeon gets spooked and you haven't up with an operation, complications, ICU, yeah. disability. Has anybody actually looked at that? Um, they have. They have, uh, and we do know that the, the patient journey begins often at the GP clinic, and that actually can make a, a big difference, which is why some of the Choosing Wisely work is being targeted at the GP level. But I think from an innovation point of view, Kaiser Permanente in the United States are trialling these uh, clinical decision support tools that are electronic, and they're flagging doctors in real time. So if a doctor orders a certain test, um, the, the algorithm is measuring the appropriateness of that test against the patient characteristics, and they're getting a flag saying, are you sure? that may be inappropriate for this given patient. Because uh, Massachusetts General has got a really interesting thing in radiology, hasn't it? Really? Yes. They've managed to tail off the radiology increase by just saying, are you sure exactly. you're still allowed to do it? And we'll give you feedback on the appropriateness of the test once right. you've done it. That's right. And there's also peer review internally, which is you know, de-identified peer review where they look for outlying orders. Uh, and, and just one other point, Norman, you mentioned about the vertebroplasty. To be fair, it is actually few and far between where there is outright ineffectiveness. Most of the work that's happening internationally is around really trying to articulate the green, the grey and the red boxes and ensuring that, that, that the care is delivered to the, the most appropriate so patient groups. corporate radiology, corporate pathology and mm. uh, vested interests will exploit the grey zone to the maximum. Mm -hmm. How dare you say it's inappropriate, we're the ones who make the clinical judgement here yeah. and, you know, and it's fine to have red flags for low back pain but we're the ones we don't want to miss. We're the ones who are going to get sued if we miss a tumour in the spine. Right. How do you manage the grey zone? Well, first of all, the red zone is where we should be focusing all of our attention initially. And once so we can sort out the completely inappropriate, sort care, out the red zone, worry about and, the and, zone worry about it. and and many people would argue that actually perhaps there's an argument for over servicing into the grey zone because, as you say, what we don't want to do is not treat a patient who may have benefited from a procedure. Certainly. I'm running late, so I'm going to get killed for saying this, but one or two questions if you were burning to ask something. Adam, just come up to one of the standing mics and I will take two questions if, you've, if there's something that you want to put. In terms of the structure of health care, yeah. um, apart from the payment system, well, first of all, ask, is, does the payment system matter? Because my understanding is, for example, um, <coughs> there are just as many knee arthroscopies done in a salaried system, unnecessary yeah. ones, as in a fee-for-service. Does the structure... It no. does matter a little bit. We do know that the fee-for-service system does exacerbate this problem a little bit, but you're quite right. In, in the UK and, so, and in places like the Mayo Clinic where they're salaried, they still do have an oversupply problem. And, and that really comes an back... An over-treatment problem. An over-treatment problem. Sorry, because it comes back to an economic concept known as um, oversupply, so supply-driven demand. If you have physicians on the ground with time to do procedures, they will do procedures. Um, so we're not getting rushed by questions, so I'll, I'll get to ask my final question. Because the, th the other thing that people say is, all the data are from the United States, they're mad, yeah. we're not, yes. we're much better, so you know, let's just relax. Well, yes. Um, unfortunately, we've started to do some pilot measuring in Australia with Australian data. Uh, You're about to shock us now, aren't I'm you? I'm about to shock you. Yeah. There's some, we're, we're actually performing worse in some areas. Worse? Yeah. In what areas? 
uh, to be to be. I'll bring You're it to your show. You're not going to give us the. Uh, It'll come to your show in due course. All right. So we'll <laughs> listen to the health report, and you can yeah. find out. Okay, fine. Can you please thank Adam Ailshot? Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.